last week we started uh, what I said <coughs> might not be true, a three-week series in conflict resolution, in dealing with personal conflict, difficulties that we have between us and people around us. And, and obviously that's a pretty broad topic. We can, you know, we have conflicts with people in our families, we have conflicts with people uh, in our church, we have conflicts with people in our community, we have conflicts with people uh, in, in our workplace. And as we began to think about that uh, last week, I, I said, I, as I thought about it uh, this past week, I thought, you know, in a good sense, I think we may have struck a nerve a little bit last week. Uh, and I say that because I think that you know, when we were, began to think about conflict and our motive in dealing with conflict, I think that it, at least it appeared that it challenged a lot of us to think about the conflicts in our own lives, in our own families, in our own situations. Because most of us, uh, most of the time, have some type of conflict. Something going on in our lives between us and, and someone else. And it is vitally important, as we said last week, how we deal with it. How we deal with conflict makes a big difference on what is going to happen in the relationships that we have in our lives. Our challenge this past week was to... Think about the conflicts that we have in our own lives. And to think about how we are dealing with those conflicts. Whether we're dealing with them face to face, whether we're ignoring them, pretending that they don't exist, or, or anything in between. And to ask ourselves, what is my motive? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I dealing with conflict the way that I am? And we said last week that our, our motive more than anything else needs to be to glorify God. As the scripture says, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. And as I'm dealing with conflict in my life, it needs to be done to glorify God. And if I am dealing with conflict in the right way, it's going to be done to glorify God. And if my motive is anything else, God won't be glorified. And our conflict won't be properly dealt with. And so I hope that this last week, that you've taken a little bit of time in, in your own situation to think about your motive. I know I did. There were several things this week that I was thinking, okay, how am I going to deal with this? And my mind went back to last Sunday morning, and I thought, okay, what's my motive? And there was at least once or twice that what I was going to do changed because I considered my motive realized that it wasn't right. And that if I was going to glorify God, I needed to react in a different way. What we did with last week's message will make a difference in how we deal with this week's message. Because our motive is the beginning, but it's not the end. And if our motive is wrong, then we won't receive this message that well. Because it's going to conflict with our motive. It's going to conflict with, with what we, we should do and what is driving <coughs> us and, and what is pushing us. You'll notice in, uh, last week we really didn't say much about the other person in our conflict. Last week we didn't say a whole lot about the person that we have conflict with. And we're not going to this week either. We're not going to this week either. And, and it's interesting, I was telling the men in my Sunday school class this morning, it's interesting because when I began to think about a series in conflict resolution, my initial thought is that we're going to focus on what Scripture says about dealing with another person in conflict. And so that's going to deal between us and them. As I began to put this series together, all of a sudden it dawned on me. The biggest part of conflict resolution isn't dealing with the other person. It's dealing with ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that we won't have to deal with another person. And I'm not saying that conflict, if you have conflict, it's your fault. I'm not saying that. And I hope I don't sound like I'm saying that because it may not be your fault and it may not be my fault. There's somebody else involved. But what, it, what I am being impressed with is the fact that before I deal with any kind of conflict, I need to look at my own life. 
I need to look at my, my own heart and my own attitude. And I need to see where I am at before I do anything else. And so the biggest part of conflict resolution is within me. And, and it's in my motive and my attitude more than anything else. In Matthew chapter 7, flip over there with me if you will this morning. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is dealing with that. In the first five verses of that chapter. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? And do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? And then Jesus says, you hypocrite. <coughs> First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And then he says in verse 6, do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Jesus here is warning his listeners, that before they deal with conflict in somebody else, that they need to look at their own lives. They need to look at themselves first. As I've thought about this passage for the last couple of weeks, it dawned on me again that this is probably one of the most misunderstood and misquoted passages in the whole Bible. How many times have you ever uh, said, you know, such and such is wrong. And had somebody look at you and say, oh, the Bible says don't judge lest you be judged. And, and they're completely misquoting that passage of Scripture. That passage of Scripture is not saying that we can't say something is wrong. It's not saying that we can't judge whether something is sinful or not. He actually, in verse 6, is telling us to do just that. He says, don't give the dogs what is holy. Well, there's a judgment to be made there. So Jesus is not saying don't judge. Uh, what he is saying is that before we judge and before we, we deal with a difficulty in somebody else's life, we need to look at our own. That we need to look into our own hearts. That we need to look into our own lives and see where we fall short. He, he's telling us that we need to look at our own hearts, our own actions, and our own motives. And that we need to make sure that we hold ourselves to the same level that we hold everybody else. We need to make sure that we are holding ourselves to the same level that we hold others. And Jesus is saying in verse 5, before we attempt to deal with the faults of other people, we need to deal with our own faults. We need to deal with our own shortcomings. You ever notice, and I'm sure you have, I have, you ever notice that we hold other people to a higher standard than we hold ourselves? Anybody ever notice that? You ever notice that we're extremely critical of other people, and yet we look at ourselves and we think, well, that's, that's not so bad when I do it. And we, we hold ourselves to a different level. We hold others to a different level. And Jesus is saying, why would you be so focused on the speck in somebody else's eye? Why would you be so focused on with a little fault in somebody else, when you've got a log sticking out of your own eye, and you're not willing to deal with that. And so Jesus is saying, before you deal with fault in somebody else, look at yourself. Look into your own heart. Look into your own life. And make sure things are right with you. Then, deal with your brother. Then, deal with somebody else. Now, in a sense, that's what I want to do this morning. I'm going to look at a number of things this morning that we need to look at in our own lives. If we're going to approach somebody else and try to deal with a conflict that exists between us and them. And as we do that this morning, I'm going to form each of these in the, the, the form of, or I'm going to state each of these in the form of a question. Because really each one is designed to help us to look at our hearts and lives. And to see where we are at before we 
deal with what appears to be a fault or a conflict between us and, and someone else. And some of these may be toe-stepping, I guess is the right word, because it was to me. When I began to ask myself some of these questions, I began to think, man, maybe there's things in my life that I need to deal with that I haven't thought about before. Maybe some of the conflicts aren't as big a deal as I may be making them to be. And maybe some of them are. But we have to look at ourselves and determine those things. Here's the first question. Am I being overly sensitive? If there's a fault between you and somebody else, one of the first things that you need to ask is, am I being overly sensitive? Am I being too sensitive? I believe that we live in a society that is overly sensitive on steroids. I mean, you've noticed today, you can't say anything. But what somebody's offended by, how dare they say that? Well, you didn't mean that at all. But that's how it was heard, that's how it was interpreted. Our society is overly sensitive. Let me share a couple of general examples. And I'll start with us. How about Christians? Are we overly sensitive today? Are Christians overly sensitive today? Let somebody get on the news, or on a TV show, or somebody at work, or in community, or wherever. Let someone make a negative remark about Christians. How do we react to that? We go absolutely nuts. How dare they do that? How dare they offend us? How dare they make a statement like that? And I think, you know, we're so quick to be deeply offended. As I thought about that this week, it's interesting to me because I, I, I spend time with a, a number, and, and intentionally do this, I spend time with a lot of people that, that are not believers. And it's interesting how they expect me to be offended by a lot of the things that they say and do. They do something and they look at me and they say, oh, I'm sorry, that must have offended you. Well, that didn't offend me at all. Did I like it? No, I didn't appreciate what you said. I didn't appreciate the curse words or the coarse joke. or I, I didn't like those things. Am I offended by it? No. Why would I expect them to act and talk like a Christian? Why would I expect them to say something that is not natural to them? They're not a Christian. They don't know Christ. They're not living to please Christ. They're an enemy of God according to Scripture. Why would I be offended at something that they say? Why would I be offended at some sin in their life? No, I'm not saying I have to condone it. I'm not saying I have to like it. I'm not saying that I have to pretend that it's right. But I'm saying I need to be careful that I'm not overly insensitive and offended by things that is natural to them. You know, and when people speak evil of Christianity, didn't Jesus say they would do that? Didn't Jesus say people hated me, they're going to hate you? Didn't Jesus say that people are not going to be receptive and like the message of Christianity? So why am I overly sensitive when the world criticizes Christianity? That's to be expected. That's normal. I don't have to like it, but I can't be overly sensitive and offended by it. They're naturally doing what is in them. And I think that we need to be careful of those things. I was also thinking, and I realize some of these are, again, touchy issues because we live in a sensitive society. I was thinking of the different uh, ethnic groups that we have and the different uh, racial groups that we have in, in our society. And, and I think, you know, when one uh, race or one group makes a comment about another, all of a sudden the little hairs on the back of the neck go up and there's horrible offense. And, and it happens that quick. We live in a society that is overly sensitive. We were talking last week in our Bible studies. I said the one that jumped out at me, and I don't know where anybody falls on this, and I'm certainly not trying to be insensitive this morning, but the one that, that jumped, that stood out to me was the, uh, the schools that all have Indian names. And how, oh, that's just, you know, that's a horrible thing. I mean, I grew up as a Canton lawyer. I thought it was an honor. That wasn't offensive. It wasn't meant to be offensive. 
It wasn't meant to put the Indian people down and lift somebody else up. It wasn't designed that way. And yet our society is like, oh, you can't mention this because we're going to be offended. And I wonder as I say that, how many conflicts exist because people are overly sensitive to things that other people say and do. They may not have been meant to hurt or be offensive at all. And, and at times we need to look at our own hearts and our own lives when there's conflict between us and somebody else and ask, am I being overly sensitive here? Am I being bothered by something that really shouldn't bother me? The same thing is true in families. How many times are people, people deeply offended by things that were said or done uh, in, in a family? How many family members today do not get along with one another? Because they were oversensitive to things that were said within the context of a family situation. And you know one of the easiest ways to tell it? And I thought about this, and I got, I'll share this example. You know one of the easiest ways to tell? And I'm just speaking generally, but... Well, we'll say you come to me and say, you know, we have a real conflict. Uh, my family's not getting along. My first question to you is going to be why. What's the situation? If you're embarrassed to tell me the situation, probably you're being overly sensitive. Because if you're embarrassed to be that upset over the situation, probably it wasn't that big a deal. And you're probably being oversensitive. And, and I say you, I'm as guilty as anybody else is. But when we're dealing with conflict, we have to look at ourselves first and ask, am I being overly sensitive? Am I all bent out of shape over something that really shouldn't bother me at all? Second question that we need to ask ourselves, and it kind of these kind of go together. Is the offense, is the fault uh, that's causing the conflict between me and somebody else? Is it something that I just need to let go? Is it something that I just need to let go? Psalm, or I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. It says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 17, verse 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before the dispute breaks out. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Peter says, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sin. Is the fault that is causing the conflict between me and somebody else something that I just need to let go? Is it one of those things that are a multitude of sin that I just need to say, okay, I'm going to put it behind me? Letting it go is a form of forgiveness. Letting it go is a form of forgiveness. It's, say, it's not saying that it didn't hurt me. It's not saying that it didn't offend me. It's not pretending that it didn't hurt. It's not pretending that it didn't offend me. It's making a conscious decision that I'm going to forgive it and let it go. I'm going to forgive it and put it behind me, and I'm not going to bring it up again. And it's not going to hinder my relationship with this other person. Doing that really is imitating God's forgiveness of us. And it can't be done with everything. I'll say that now. We're going to talk about that more, if not this week, next week. That can't be done with everything. But it can with many things. And in doing that is imitating God's forgiveness. In Psalm 103, we read earlier, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Later on in that psalm, it says that he understands that we are dust. God understands that, that uh, we're human and that we fall short. Do we understand that with the people that we have conflict with? Do we understand with people that we have conflict with that they're human and that they fall short? God understands that about us. And God, in His mercy and in His love, certainly through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, forgives us of our sin. 
In Ephesians 4, chapter, 30, or chapter 4, verse 32, Paul says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Sometimes, some sins, or not sins, some offenses against us, we need to overlook. We need to let go. Just as God forgives us. Now, you certainly can't do that with every offense. And there's some things you shouldn't do that with. If, if an offense has created a wall between you and another person, and it's caused you to feel, I don't know how to word this, feel differently toward that person, for an extended period of time, you can't overlook that. You can't just let that go. That needs to be dealt with. And we're going to talk more about how to do that in the next couple of weeks. But, it, it, you know, if, if the offense has put a wall between you and another person and, and damaged your relationship, then you can't just overlook it. It has to be dealt with. If the offense uh, is a sin against God, then you have to deal with it. You, you have to confront that sin, and you have to deal with it according to what the Scripture says. And we're not going to get into that this morning. We're going to talk about that more uh, beginning next week. But we need to look at an offense against us and ask, is it something that I can just forgive and let go? Is it something that I'm being overly sensitive about? And again, I need to let it go. Another question we need to ask ourselves. Is the personal conflict worth it? Is the conflict that exists between me and another person is it worth it? Is it worth the conflict? Is it worth the cost? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 25, He says, Agree with your adversary, the person you have a conflict with. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Now, what is that saying? Jesus is saying conflict has a cost. And, and Jesus is saying you and I had better deal with our conflict quickly before the cost grows. And before it gets more expensive and before it gets more costly in, in a number of ways. The cost of conflict and difficulty is often more than we expect it to be. And I'm not going to get into the details this morning, but I can look back in my own family. Over the last 30 to 35 years, and see conflict that, that began that many years ago and is still undealt with today. And the cost of that conflict is so much greater over the last 35 years than anybody would have ever dreamt it would have been 35 years ago. If somebody then had sat down and said, I need to count the cost. What is this conflict going to do for 30 or 35 years? I can't tell you the amount of pain and hardship and difficulty that would have been avoided if somebody would have only stopped count at the cost. Ken Sandy wrote a book, I believe it's entitled The Peacemaker, and, and I'm kind of using his book as an outline for this study. And he said this uh, in his book, he says, unresolved conflict can lead to many types of prisons and can exact penalties that we never anticipate. In addition to robbing you of time, <coughs> property, or money, Prolonged conflict can damage your relationships and, and destroy your reputation. It can also imprison you in a dungeon of self-pity, resentment, or bitterness. Moreover, the anxiety and negative thinking generated by conflict can spill over and hurt people who are close to you, such as your family and coworkers. The cost of conflict is usually so much greater than we ever anticipated. And if we would only stop and look at our own hearts and our own lives and say, wait a minute, 
Is this conflict worth it? Is the conflict that I am not dealing with worth pursuing? Is it worth the cost that it's going to, to inflict upon my life and my family and, and those that I have a relationship with? Many times the cost of how we deal with conflict is higher than the cost of the conflict itself. And yet we continue to pursue it. Is it worth it? The last question that we want to ask this morning is this. Is my personal attitude right? And, and all of this, they all go together. They overlap in so many ways. Is my personal attitude toward this conflict and toward the person that I have a conflict with right? Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, Paul is dealing with conflict. And he's dealing with a conflict between at least two people, if not more, in the church of Philippi. And, and really... We don't know much about what this conflict was. We do know that in a short letter like Philippians, it was important enough that Paul wrote about it. And he wrote about it in a fairly open letter for the church to read so that they would deal with it. So it, it certainly must have been a significant conflict. Paul says in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 2, he says, I implore Euodia and I implore Synthesis to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, which most believe is another person involved. Help these women who labored with me in the gospel. With Clement also. And the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice always in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your, excuse me, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, there's a conflict. There's a battle that's going on in the church between these, these women. And, and Paul is, is writing to them. Now, here's the interesting thing to me. And this fits with what we're, we're talking about this morning. It, it's interesting that Paul, and I've, I've practiced saying these names all week, so I've got to say them a couple of times to make it worth my effort. He talks to Euodia, and he talks to Stintashi. I actually looked that up online and found a pronunciation guide that read it out loud. I'm not sure how close that is, but it's closer than I would have been a week ago. But uh, Euodia and Stintashi, he writes to them. Notice what he doesn't tell them. He doesn't say to them, sit down and talk to each other. Now, it would get to that, but he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, approach one another and, and talk it out. Notice what he says. Everything he says revolves around their own heart and their own attitude. He tells them, look at yourself, in so many words. He says to them, as they're battling and as he's telling them that they need to work it out, he says, rejoice in the Lord. That's an attitude. That's an attitude. And he says again, in verse 4, again, I say, rejoice. That's an attitude. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. That's an attitude. He's not saying, Euodia, let synthesis gentleness be seen. He says, no, no, no. Let your gentleness be seen. You have the right attitude. You have the right spirit. See, they're, they're being told to look at themselves. He says, let your gentleness be known. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication. What's he saying? 
at yourself. Look at yourself. Go to prayer. Ask God. Take it to Him. Let Him give you peace. And then as He, as he goes on down through it, He says, okay, think on things that are just and true and right, and those things of a good report. Now, if you're in the middle of conflict, what are you thinking about? Things of a good report? Things of revenge? Things of bitterness? No. Paul says, wait a minute. Think on things that are right. Think on things that are good. You see, Paul is saying, check your own attitude. Look at yourself. See where you are at. Make sure your heart is right. Make sure you're thinking on the right things. Make sure that you're meditating on those things. And then he says, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, you do those things. What's he saying? Make sure you're being obedient to God. Make sure your life is right. Take the beam out of your own eye. Then worry about the sawdust in somebody else's eye. You see, that's what Paul's saying. Look at yourself first. All of the things, or almost all of the things that he says, revolve around these women's attitudes. And the fact that they need to look at themselves. We need to ask in the midst of our own personal conflict, what's my attitude? Am I seeking to blame? Am I seeking to hurt? Am I seeking to prolong the conflict? Am I seeking to find fault? Am I bitter? Am I trying to get even or to hurt someone? Or am I rejoicing in the fact that God is able to restore my relationship? And that God will work in the midst of this? And that I have the opportunity to step out on faith and be obedient to God? What's my attitude? What's my spirit? As we seek to resolve conflict in our, in our lives, we need to look at ourselves. We need to not start with the other person. We need to start right here. We need to look at ourselves. And I'm not saying this morning that the conflict that we are in is necessarily our fault. It may not be your fault at all. You may not be to blame at all. But you, you and I cannot deal with it unless our heart is right. Unless we are motivated by the desire to glorify God. And motivated by, by my desire first to be obedient to Him. I hope this past week that we've examined our motives. And I hope that we continue to do that. My challenge this week is to look at our hearts and look at our lives. And to make sure that we take the log out of our own eye before we begin to work on the speck that is in somebody else's eye. Let us God for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, I, I just pray that you would help us to grab all of these things. Lord, they're, they're, they're hard, they're challenging, they're difficult to hear, maybe even more difficult to put to practice in our lives. But Lord, they're necessary. Lord, as we all have conflict and we all face conflict, help us to consider our motive. Help us to look deep into our own hearts and our own lives and to make sure that we are motivated by the right thing. Lord, help us as well to look deep in our hearts to see what our attitude and our motive and, and, and just where we are at. Lord, help us to make sure that we take the log out of our own eye before we ever attempt to take the speck out of somebody else's. Lord, again, help us to understand, help us to lean on you and step out in obedience to practice these things in our lives. We thank you in Christ's name.